Right. So, yes, let's uh, get going. Um, hopefully people have had copies of the agendas and papers. Um, one or two seem to have gone into spam. So if you find them in spam um, or you've got things that or you've got it from somebody else, um, put that in the chat or send me an email um, and I'll add you to the list. Um, so minutes of the last meeting. Thank you, Teresa, for these. Um, so there was um, an action for Mark Jones from the DFT to talk to Sipti about tram train. Um, Mark has um, it's no longer with the DFT. Um, Triumph, who would best be to pick that conversation up? I, I believe that would be myself. Um, I, I can't provide any updates now. I would I would take that one away and, and get back to your team. Yeah. OK. Um, likewise, there was um, one between Mike and Mark, uh, Mike Baxter from uh, Leicester, um, who I don't think he's on the call today. Um, and um, the other ones of note. Um, so rail data management team attending PTIC meetings regularly. Um, happy to invite them. Um, I don't know what others think. Do we invite them every other meeting for an update on the rail data marketplace and where that is? Or does that seem about right? I think it'll be useful to have updates from them, definitely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Cool. Um, and um, not having been at the last um, one because I was... Um, poorly. Yeah, poorly, yes, yes. Um, there was... Um, John suggested that um, we carry on with 15 minute neighbourhoods. Uh, I absolutely agree. Um, and I think we ought to keep a, an eye on it and do things. And that's why we've got, or one of the reasons why we've got Ordnance Survey friends here to talk to us about what they're doing, because that's will help that sort of approach. Um, and um, Nick and Theresa, there was one about talking to Mark Jones about um, Hertfordshire. Um, so presumably that's a triumph conversation if you've not had that. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. OK. Um, and um, I'm sure Peter Stoner and David Batchelor have had a conversation between um, September and now. OK, so that was the minutes of the last meeting. Um, one of the things that happened at the last meeting was um, a discussion about 15 minute neighbourhoods and the work that a subgroup had done in putting a paper together. Um, and um, it was suggested that it would be sensible to get Ordnance Survey um, along because they have been doing some work on uh, some new data sets, which might be useful for not only 15 minute neighbourhoods, but I think also wider public transport, um, bus stops, accessibility and things like that. Um, and so we've got um, Simon and um, Mark, I think, um, Mark, Mark couldn't join us, sorry. OK, so we've got Simon Smith from Ordnance Survey who's going to talk to us about what they're doing with the National Geographic database. Um, cool. So over to you, Simon. 
Thank you. Um, thanks for the invite. I'll just quickly share a screen and then I'll talk to that if it's OK. Um, yeah, yeah. When I share the screen, I won't be able to see hands, but please feel free to <laughs> interrupt uh, and ask questions. It's um, yeah, an interactive session. Hopefully it makes it a bit more interesting for me as well anyway. Um, yeah, so my name's Simon Smith, Transport Product Manager at Ordnance Survey. Um, been with the company three years. Uh, don't have really a background in geospatial, but learning every day. Um, and what I was going to cover through today was um, the PSJ contract, which I'll explain what the acronym is later. Um, data asks and then more specifically around sort of routing and connectivity piece that we've done specifically which we just got approved by the geospatial commission geospatial commission is our sort of primary customer um, we are uh, owned by bays or as our, our state keen st our primary stakeholder um, but we're a public body you probably know all this um, i'll go on to the next slide cool hopefully um do you think just quickly, uh, I'll, I'll go through these because they may be so, might be slightly less interesting. But Geospatial Commission are the our primary customer. They have nine key areas of interest, of which uh, transport is one, and they also have four missions about promoting safeguard of and use of local um, location data, access better location data as well, also enhance capability, skill sets, and awareness, which through user engagement is quite prolific in terms of the skills to use our products and in general geospatial data and also enable innovation so grow um, revenues and, and growth economic growth for, for, for GB UK sorry GBLD or PLC even um, just quickly I won't I said I won't it's not a pitch around uh, public sector geospatial agreement but it's a 10-year contract uh, initially, it's a fixed set of deliverables, which most of our cover today, although we've managed to change those based on user uh, engagement and feedback because we wanted to deliver more the, for, for less, if you like. Um, it is a collaboration for a framework, um, so it may be a contract, but actually it's also used to try and develop um, de other data and services that fit and suit the public sector. Um, Tenure contract started in April 2020 and it reaches all public sector organisations, which, which is over 5,000 organisations. Um, we have a, a new access method, which is our primary thing that we've sort of been building over the last two, two and a half years, which is the National Geographic Database. It's an online platform. Um, it's uh, run and owned by Ordnance Survey and it basically covers or contains all our authoritative data that describes the geography of Great Britain. Um, I'll explain a little bit more how, how it's slightly different to what you may be more familiar today. There's a bit of animation, sorry for that. Um, so yeah, as I said, transport is one of nine key themes. Um, today, the PSJ customers ha have access to all this data uh, and the services underneath underneath this contract. I also put this in here because I wasn't sure if it was relevant, but it might be irrelevant. But, um, local authority contractors also have access to the same data. So if you're contracted by a local authority, we have um, OS uh, pricing and licensing terms where you have access to the data as long as you don't use it for commercial gain. And also there's not deemed to be some commercial uh, or competitive advantage over your, your rivals. So one bus service, Blue, gets the advantage of perhaps having um, PSGA data, but actually bus service, Red, doesn't and then if that's a sort of seen as a being a competitive advantage then it's probably a difficult and probably not in the right um yeah might be unfair um but it's there if needed um so in terms of access customers basically have access to this large database um in one location um and rather than having separate sort of products as we do today all that data is now just in one in one lump and then we have a product or a sort of a functionality called select and build where you can go in and select the things that you want from multiple sort of themes. So whether you want addressing and transport, you can go in and collect that. Um, and you can access it through a download, select and build. Um, you also have APIs for features and tiles uh, and it's selected by data themes, but you can select cross themes as well. I'm going quickly because I think the rest of it's probably more interesting. This is where I'm going to cover off the um, transport enhancements. Some of them are enhancements on the existing um, transport data we have, and also some of them are new. A lot of them are new, actually. Um, the reason why we're doing it is we're to help uh, evidence-based policy making, 
protection of life, efficient transport systems, uh, environmental monitoring and regulation, and efficient uh, services for uh, citizen services as well. And then some of the key sort of transport uh, themes that we got from or use cases from our user engagement is around sort of monitoring sort of national cycle network framework um, uh, network, sorry, uh, safe routing, uh, encouraging active travel, efficient good, uh, transport of goods, and traffic analysis modelling and emergency response planning and infrastructure asset impact on climate change. I can hear my voice. I just wondered if someone had something to say or is there a mic that's given me some feedback? If not, I'll carry on. I think cool. it's just a mic, Simon. <laughs> no worries. OK, this is um, what thank you for confirming. This is, um, I guess, a quick sort of street scene of, of the of the stuff that's new and the stuff that's existing. Um, structures are existing. Uh, so is the road network. So there's two main transport areas which are current. What we're expanding is the um, tracks and paths of, of, net, of to a GB network. So that's expanding from what is currently just an urban area, but to mountain and moorland and rural areas. Um, if I just go around clockwise, you've got then cycle lanes uh, and bus lanes and street lights, um, which are slightly delayed because we were looking at me different methods of capture that are cost effective. We had a fixed budget, plus we also put in our own money to try and capture these things as well as we can. Um, so we've now got an internal approval to do that and Geospatial Commission now need to approve those changes. And I'll talk about some of those changes because they're improvements. Um, we also include road speeds in terms of limits and also averages for all roads. Um, payments, so we didn't, we, we'd never actually had a, a pavement network before. It, it does exist in, top, in our Topo product, but we're actually creating um, an understanding of where they are and, uh, in terms of widths and also lengths and where they start and end. Also creating a rail network, which is a simplified rail network, so it wouldn't be um, a, a direct uh, copy of um, or similarity to network rail, but it's about how places are connected. And I, could, uh, I was going to cover off that in later. Uh, we also include road widths, which is around uh, access for mainly for access for, 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 for large vehicles, but also for winter planning. And then the, I think the thing that um, Tim was asking us for, to cover off was um, the MRN, which is the multimodal routable network. So that's the um, new, new data. I've tried to condense some of the slides. They might be a bit busy, um, but we again, stop me if you have questions. In terms of rail, um, we've got a simplified rail network. Uh, which covers all rail networks. So that's any, anything from even a uh, museum as well and vernicular, um, but also the tram networks as well. And the focus for all of these uh, will be that we have a, a, G, a full GB um, data set. Um, and also that the rail network in particular will be will form part of the MRN, the multimodal routable network, which we cover at the end. I'll have a short uh, demo hopefully to show you. Um, also cycle lanes, so we want to stand where the cycle lanes are for active travel England, Scotland and Wales. Um, we're capturing those in terms of where there are painted lines and also ideally segregated uh, cycle lanes and also shared cycle lanes with pedestrians as well. And we identify those with sort of start and end points, uh, which side of the road as well and what level of coverage uh, along a road link. Uh, bus lanes, um, we're going to get a cover off similar in a similar fashion where bus lanes start and end. Um, which side of the road? Um, uh, do they have some kind of segregation? Some do, not many don't, but some do. Um, I have a question to give me a little uh, a break of a cup of tea. Is that um, on, on the bus lanes, it, how I guess my question to you is how best to represent bus lanes and and, and how and what sort of things do we need to avoid? Uh, I don't know if there's a anyone has a, a thought or, or an idea about how that could be done. Don't worry, Behan. This is John Carr. I I think um, in terms of visual representation, it is probably quite useful if you can get a reasonably accurate uh, illustration of how the bus lane is marked on the road, but Beyond that, there's questions about the hours of operation, 
there's questions about what other vehicles are permitted to use it. Cycles and taxis are the two most common, but you you might find the odd uh, authority has gone for HGVs as well. Um, and I, I guess really what I'm saying is that um, because all of these things are inherently local in how they operate, the more local detail you can give, the better. And when you get that level of detail, what does that enable either you or other road users or planners or service providers do that they can't do without? Uh, one, it enables you if you're getting, uh, for example, um, uh, complaints that the bus is not always getting through the first cycle of the lights or the first opportunity at the junction, whichever it may be. Um, that could be a question which could be uh, addressed by altering the stop line. Um, because that, that sort of problem is likely to be um, vehicles cutting in from the outside lane um, and, you know, blocking off because the, the bus is no longer to be able to be first off the blocks, as it were. Yeah. Um, the other question we haven't, uh, I haven't mentioned is the, the extent of infringement, but where you would get that data from, I'm not quite certain at the moment. Does that mean how it um, how it sits within the in the carriageway? Is that what you're inferring? It's the number of times that you get blocking off either because vehicles are crossing into the bus lane or it does happen. And this is where the width is important. Uh, it does happen that you'll get a wide SUV or something like that that will overhang the bus lane so the bus can't get past. Now again, I'm not sure that's the sort of thing you should be addressing through this level of data analysis, but if there were a way of tracking the number of um, incidents of that type, then it is a way in which you can uh, say to the engineers, let's have a look at this and let's see what we can do about it. Okay, thank you. And then in terms of like sort of curbside management, is is parking restrictions important for buses or is that a given that um, I don't know if those those kind of things sort of obstruct or infringe smooth, <laughs> smooth running of, uh, of, of buses? I think the hawks amongst us would argue that there shouldn't be any um, yeah. parking permitted in a bus lane. Yeah. Uh, but loading certainly has to be in certain cases where you've okay. got shops that are only frontage serviced. Um, I think all you can do is really to repeat the detail of the TRO. Yeah. And then see what sort of uh, feedback you're getting from users and uh, general traffic. Yeah. Yeah, we're, look, we're, we're in dialogue with DFT around how to represent TROs on the highway network, including yeah. Yeah, loading areas, parking restrictions, and so on. So, again, to try and help with the, I guess one of the main use cases are around congestion, and therefore that affects obviously yeah. waiting times, journey times, air quality, and so on. So, yeah. okay, cool. Thank you very much. And um, thanks for the break as well. <laughs> Has anybody um, else got any thoughts on what would be important? I've got not maybe uh, Dan Saunders here from Base Map. Um, <clears throat> not really on bus lanes per se, but uh, is the way of collecting data? Would you be able to find out if a bus stop is on the highway or off the carriageway? So would you have a indentation so it's not going to block traffic or anything like that? Would you be able to ascertain that through the same capture method at all? Um, is this where bus buses filter with existing? No, uh, so if you think where bus stops, sometimes a bus will stop and on the main on the main carriageway as right. part of it. Other times the bus will stop and it will be filtered off the main carriageway. It pulls uh, into a siding or something like that. I'd be good to know if that could be that could be captured. I see some enhancements there with NAPTA and the link between the two uh, would be quite a good a good usage case. I'm not sure how you capture the bus lanes, but if that was possible, um, that might be quite quite interesting. Yeah, I think that's quite. 
prescient actually dan with the introduction of floating bus stops that are sort of between cycle lanes and carriageway road carriageways and things like that exactly right mm. yeah is it is a floating bus stop a temporary bus stop was that something different no so traditionally a bus stop would be on the footpath um and you know adjacent to the to the main carriageway but where you've got cycle lanes sometimes the cycle lanes will be um effectively in between the the normal footpath and the bus stop so to get to the bus stop somebody yeah. has to cross over cross the that. cycle i know you mean lane yeah. and it's sort of in the middle of carriageways yeah but it's the carriageway of the of the cycle lane that people pedestrians have to cross to get to the bus stop is that what you mean yes that's yeah. right yeah, yeah i know exactly what you mean now thank you yeah, yeah. um yeah. so i'm asked the question yeah i think um so our initial capture will be picking up where bus lanes are effectively painted on the road we did think about how we might capture bus stops i think our first pre premise is to capture where they are and then attribute or or increase or enhance that detail at a later stage however we haven't started this work yet so i think where possible i'll see if we can include what we think identify if we can identify bus stops um we'll be using uh, aerial imagery and also our national cyclical um review as well so we'll capture initially sort of a baseline of, of from imagery um but that we also then want to go back and then capture some of that detail so it's very possible uh, and makes sense that we do go back and capture where those bus stops are whether they're floating or whether they're filtered off the road carriageway or uh, or actually obstructing the flow of traffic so i think that could be could be part of the scope as well but it's not in scope right now but that doesn't mean we wouldn't do it um our intention is that we would start to capture this all things being well and geese and geospatial uh, commission agreeing to it from spring onwards next year and that's kind of that's how we kind of start in terms of a time frame thanks dan and hello okay as well. um we've got nick knowles hi, hi yes uh, th this is sort of more uh, i'm nick knowles um uh, worked on um various uh, standards like uh, netex and trans exchange um the this is more sort of comment from the uh, question of course one of the major use cases for bus lanes is that they're prefer they're often desirable as cycle lanes for cycle journey planners um and of course in most cases you're allowed to cycle in the bus lane so in terms of sort of flagging bus lanes as cycle lanes you could probably do it by exception and that it's those, those few cases where they you're not allowed to cycle in the bus lane um like maybe when it's an underpass or or a, um, a main road um uh, are, are probably key things to capture uh, because otherwise um, that would allow one to make a general assumption that if it's a bus lane it's it's cyclable in so, so, so as a uh, as a premise we would uh except that bus lanes are form part of the cycle network by exception we would then identify those exceptions that's right, right. yeah cool thank you Nick. Uh, that, that's that's the same premise that we have is that yeah. again talking with active travel england scotland and, and also wales is that that's the same premise is that they yeah. are they form part of the cycle network um which yeah it's good and bad depending on how you look at it um cool is there anything else from us um, Nick, you mentioned that, which is great to validate what our thinking is, but is there anything in particular that you'd like to see different or more of or less of? Um, well, I mean, it, it, it all depends the use case you're trying to satisfy. Um, and um, I guess that the main value of having the bike lanes is actually for from a, um, a Traveller's point of view is from having better information about when they can, when they can use them and not so uh, and also what the which also has congestion implications. Um, but it sounds like you're aiming to to cover that. Um, uh, so, and off the top of my head, there's, there's not, nothing that leaps out at me. 
Thank you. No, we do. Yeah, the routing in general, the routing um, restrictions, uh, road routing restrictions information we do capture and put that on the highways. But that's intention that we include that for um, as much of the modal, the, as many of the modes that are present on the road and off the road as well. Actually, there, there's this, perhaps one interesting interaction with Subvartic type stuff, which is that where you have a priority bike, bike a bus lane that has a priority at a light so that if the bus, bus approaches it sets off a detector that sets the uh, light, light off uh, in the bus's favour. Um, uh, it's like if you're building a, an AVL system it's so often of relevance to know where those um, detector beacons are. Um, so if that's something that can, can routinely, routinely be captured because you're capturing all the other information, sort of knowing where the priority lights and where the beacons are would is, is potentially of interest, I think. But yeah, they, They're quite variable these days with them being virtual rather than cut loops. They, they can shift quite frequently. It's all done in, in, in software now, is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I suspect that will be quite challenging to to keep up to date. Um, John Carr and then Peter, and then we ought to get back to um, uh, Simon's next Peter slide. Peter was first. Peter was first in the queue. Oh, was he? OK, sorry, Peter then. <laughs> OK, thank you. Right, thank you, John. Uh, I, I was just uh, wondering whether um, this bus lane um, uh aspect is, is is very interesting going to be very valuable i was just wondering whether there's any potential tie up with naptan in terms of um just thinking about the scope of naptan and whether possibly they ought to have a some sort of referencing for bus lanes so that we could um cross reference very easily to the 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 map the the the, 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 the Sorry, Mum, just okay. I'm talking elsewhere. Sorry, sorry about this. <laughs> um, so that we can make an easy link to the different aspects of the bus lanes in terms of the, the times of um, operation, that sort of thing. So I've just think a referencing point, really, and whether nap Naptown could be uh, extended. We, we, oh, well, we do um, in my demo, hopefully it still works. I've taken a screenshot if it doesn't. Um, we do use BODS, which I think is a subset of Naptown. So you're probably familiar with the bus open data service, um, which has bus stops um, and the geometry between those bus stops and also the timetables. So I don't know if that is what you're referring to or you're looking for something different. Well, we're very familiar with BODS, of course, um, but um, um, I think it's actually just the actual reference. This is a bus lane and, and how do we uh, reference them nationally? so that we could know where what other information could be attached to it we could obviously relate it to any bus stops i mean sometimes there's bus stops on bus lanes but not always they're obviously related to sections of road as well but um it, it's just that that tie up and i just wonder whether there's any any point there that could be uh, be considered is it the taxonomy of how how things are labeled and being consistent is that what you're saying or yeah, I, I think so. Um, okay. uh, um, yeah, it, obviously the, these the bus lanes are coming from an individual transport authority approach, and there may be lots of different methods in which ways they come through with schemes in, in the investment side. Um, this is a this is way of, of possibly just you are bringing them together now in one place on the map, and I, I think your contribution is particularly to show where they actually are. And that's brilliant. Um, if there was then the potential to reference from the map, of course, to any other source of information, possibly through NAPTAN, um, that, that might be quite useful. Cool. Yeah, I mean, we've got Sarah from the DFT that's going to join us later, and she looks after NAPTAN. I've just um, joined now. Sorry for my delay. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> um, so Sarah will be able, I mean, it will be good. It's probably one for for Sarah with a futures of NAPTAN um, view to, to to talk to Simon about how those two can be can be linked together, um, bus lanes yeah. and, and bus stops. Um, 
Yeah, that'd be great. That... Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you to uh, later on email then. Cool. I think actually mm. Sarah did a demo of it fairly recently. Um, but yes, please do. Just to be sure I've got the right Sarah, as I as I can't see. Yeah, Sarah Al Adley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, can, can I also be involved in, in that introduction? If you're okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks sure. for that. I've just dropped my email in the chat. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. There was Peter. I thought there was someone else. Yeah, was, uh, John Carr. John. Yeah. Uh, uh, two points, really. First of all, interested that you're using aerial techniques, uh, but I would say that you're particularly fine with bus stops in rural areas. Uh, they're not probably that easy to spot from the uh, from the air. Indeed, not from the road sometimes, uh, because they're in uh, at lane ends and things like that. Um, and also in urban areas, frequently they're obscured by vegetation. Uh, but the other one that I think is important is, are you going to incorporate road condition into this in any way? Um, not, not within the scope now, but when you say road condition, are you, talk, are you talking about the quality of the network or are you talking about the surface finish or i'm talking about the the quality of the surface in um in bus lanes with some kinds of tarmac you you get tracking because the vehicles are all following same path with a, a fairly high frequency in some of them um so you effectively get rutting in the roads uh that I think is partially determined uh, as well by what the subsurface is like. Uh, but the other thing is that if you get on a new bus, and uh, I'll instance a particular um, example which I use fairly frequently, if you go between York and Pickering on one of the coastliner buses, which are generally well maintained, very modern vehicles, they ride almost as well as railway vehicles where you have a newly surfaced carriageway, but where you get old concrete carriageways or cracked carriageways in urban areas, they are absolutely awful to, to, to ride in. Um, that obviously costs the bus operator something, although it's rarely identified specifically how much. Probably also costs us all in, in using private cars as well. But if we're going to be successful in modal split for net zero and other objectives, then it is desirable that the bus may be of high quality, but so should the surface be that it runs on. And you seem to be putting together a tool which if you could put the, the condition in as well, it would be very easy to use it to pull out what the overall condition was and to begin to investigate you know how much difference that condition makes to performance of the routes uh, and, uh, john i think that this is perhaps straying into a level of detail that that's worth spinning out into a separate conversation um with with simon and uh, i suggest that to cover off the detail and things like that if we get together a separate session yeah. um, in January or something um, for people that are interested in this and and, and at that sort of level of detail and some other well if we've got yeah. this then we can link it to that type yeah um, you know some of the bigger thinking that might we might be able to go on that's yeah. probably worth it yeah Tim just to head it off at the past though I think it would be massive mission creep for Ordnance Survey to try and use a tool and a system which is not designed for that purpose uh, to its mission creep. Um, you know, the kind of uh, aerial survey that um, Ordnance Survey is doing would not compete with the likes of GAST, who mm. do an annual survey running six vehicles on on every major road all over the United Kingdom every year. And that's also, you know, the, the focus of other uh, surveys uh, and th th they have a much much more detail than it would be reasonable to expect ordnance survey to conduct i i, I think it would just be the overlap 
<laughs> and and that just adding to that, Nick, really good point there. This that aspect probably really useful in terms of engaging with the highway part of local authorities, which is who deals with this. And there's a whole massive area of asset management and maintenance and yeah. how you manage road condition and, and all of that stuff. What isn't happening is the joining up probably between that and what the bus operators need and what and what John Carr mentions. But yeah. I, I agree. I don't know whether I mean, it might be something that Peter want to follow up in that route. But for the purposes of OS, but I think that, that's where the gap exists. It's unfortunately it's joining up the the yeah. bus operations inside local authorities with highways which we get involved in and it doesn't go as well as it could i will i will sign you up then nick to that group (laughs) (laughs) and uh and if we move on simon yep sure We'll come back if you want. If you have me back, I'll come back. Yeah, Um, (laughs) and I think it'd be useful for simon and and it'd be nice to invite geist and um one or two others as well yotta who are yeah. you know in the in the business and and do this and and the gaist survey is provided to dft i think already yeah I think okay we'll, we'll talk about that later nick yeah i thought uh, the uk pms work that's already been sort of managed i think by dft would probably be worth looking at how that could be linked yeah. in um and just quickly that the the initial baseline is just to, is to do aero imagery and then the ncr which is this national cyclical review is around uh, same again, aerial imagery, but also putting out where we've got change intelligence, we put out surveyors on the, down onto, onto the ground and, and capture things in a bit more in detail. So we'll be looking for those things that we miss under tree covers or we want greater detail of bus, le- of bus stops, etc. So that's kind of... Can I just of, ask um, a really stupid question? And people can hmm. shoot me down for this. You might be adding detail to this, but NAPTAN contains all the locations for the bus stops so i don't quite understand is this adding another layer to that are you connecting in with naptam or am i asking a really stupid question i think the bus stops are fine um i think the question was about would we be able to capture those i guess those modal change points those in more detail so bus stops i guess is one thing okay which, def- which is definitely covered in, in naptam um what i'm hearing is that understanding the um i guess the extent of a bus stop whether it's actually Filtered, okay. filtered within the highways, off the highways, whether there's a floating uh, bus stop where you, you have a, a change of uh, of busing to pedestrian, but also it conflicts with maybe cycle lanes. Those kind of that kind of right. detail. Right. Okay. That, so I think cool. like, there are, you're right. Naptown. We're not trying to replicate anything that's in Naptown. If anything, I guess it's one of the one of my questions. It's probably coming later, but I'll ask now. Is would you like to see some of the Naptown data in our data? I, you know, we, we kind of take the third party data, we put in the bus stops, or do you want to add it in yourself? Um, mm. Yeah, what, what other like, nap time data? Is that is that something that would minimise work for you guys? Would well, it you've be... got a thumbs up from Nick and a hands up from David there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, can't I, see I would say if you uh, just to, to take up Teresa's thing about nap time, the nap time locations aren't as accurate as the Ordnance Survey locations would be. And if we can get something between your ATCO code in NAPTAN and the unique reference number in the audit survey database, I think that'll cover 90% of what's needed yeah. there. Yeah, here's some of the questions comes later, but okay, so we, <laughs> we are using ATCO codes and CRS codes for modal change points. So again, so that you can link uh, third party, particularly NAPTAN data to the locations that we capture. So you can apply that, that, that the same data. It may be, may be in in different locations shall we say um which actually the next slide actually i think uh, coming up soon cool um i'm just very conscious you i can talk for a long time but i guess you've got other things on the agenda we, we, um, we do and we do need to move on unfortunately okay cool so street lights um capturing the locations using aero imagery again and we do that as a baseline and then we capture in detail things that we miss and we're going to use change intelligence which will probably be working with the likes of geoplace and going directly to to the local highways authorities to improve that data going forward. Um, yeah, this is this is the I think the thing that uh, Tim specifically asked around. So we had a contractual item around integrated transport network. Um, it's the contract scope is about providing an integrated set of transport networks that enhance both their coverage and attribution to enable accurate multimodal routing across GB. Right, quite a mouthful, but essentially a multimodal routable network. Um, the areas of focus was again making sure it's GB, um, create the connectivity across a suite of networks. So that's uh, initially going to be pedestrian 
vehicle and rail uh, and focus on an output that supports uh, adoption. So we, again, we were quite conscious of what the different formats that are available. Um, our current products are produced in GML, but now we've released Data Hub uh, and our Geo, um, NGD products, they come in Geo Package, which is an OGC uh, open standard. Um, in terms of key use cases, one is distance, one is travel time, and one is service infrastructure planning, and then also policy definition and measurement, so of investment of success, so measuring where money's been spent and then where it actually then is um, return is hopefully some kind of return on that investment. Um, getting very close to a demo now, Tim. Um, you're not expected to, to, to look at this. It's quite a busy slide. Um, if you look at the left-hand side, what we've done here, this is uh, Southampton Parkway uh, railway station. And what we've got here, you've got a mixture of modes, of course, you've got the rail uh, and you've also got the road network. We can also uh, include the pedestrian, but it gets very busy. So just sticking with road and, and rail. So you can start doing routing um, for vehicles to a, a railway station. Um, this actually doesn't allow vehicles on the rail, but actually you can start start planning journeys. And what we've done is we've created sort of access points and joining up of road networks um, to the rail network using a sort of pseudo centroid node in the center of a, a station extent, which then allows sort of a complete topological network. So I'll show you a demo in a moment. That's been signed off just recently by uh, the GC. Uh, that means that we will start looking to develop that in the new year. And thanks to if I go to the next slide. So this is a backup slide if if my div demo didn't work. But if I just quickly flip to another slide, another screen. Here we go. So all we've done, we're using um, an open um, routing software, um, partly for testing and also to show that actually it kind of works. Uh, and it's not, it's kind of ambivalent to whether it's a proprietary or open software. It's just a, it's a data set that can be used in both. We're not kind of trying to um, skew the market in any way. And I've just done a couple of pin drops um, starting in Radcliffe. This is in Nottingham where we've done a sort of full detailed um, data sets of the different networks. And if I just sort of quickly plan the trip, um, you can see that the journey um, from Radcliffe on Trent is a starts with a if you left at 138 starts with a walk uh, takes a bus um, it also gives you uh, an indication of when the tram going through tram and then also the last bit of the walk so it gives you some indication of the f of the total journey uh, broken down into whether it's walking bus and then tram and then I use tram because uh, it's an extension of the um, the rail network rather than trying to show you long distances. But in principle, um, these timetables are lifted uh, as GTFS files from BODs. Um, there aren't any GTFS files for um, rail, so we had to create our own. So we went to the rail data group and got those. And there's some code on GitHub, which we've managed to get some rather smart data scientists to create those um, files for us. But if, essentially, these are some of the things you can do. You know, we don't strictly include all those but the BODS data works well because it has its own geometry um, and it also has its own location and we can just simply with note in, within this modal trip planner open trip planner we can actually show you the the, um, the routes um, any questions I've got maybe one more to show you in a sec if not uh, maybe I could just yeah, show you Nick. Uh, yeah, yes, um, I, I had a question. Uh, I was particularly interested in the in-station navigation. Are you covering that so that sort of how do you, can you get from plat to a particular platform um, with access accessibility noted on that? Um, as that's a very sort of key requirement if you're doing full end-to-end -end journey planning to be able to show um, which platforms are accessible and which step, you know, whether you need to take a lift or steps or whatever to get there. That, so that was a, a question, and then I also had a comment, which was that um, if the SEN um, uh, NetX model and the trans trans model uh, SEN model have a sort of detailed path link model, that's I think it's very similar to the detailed navigation links that you've got, and so it'd certainly be interesting to try and make sure that. Um, there's some of the attribution is is aligned, so it's possible to exchange data and interoperate for where people want to bring data sets together. Yeah, we'd love to do that. I think that's one of our core principles, just to make our products as linkable with other third party data sets. So um, 
I know Tim's probably looking at his watch now, but I can't see. But I guess we, we could follow up on that in more detail. And yes, we'd like to do that. Uh, you go back to your initial question about accessibility. The answer is probably no. Uh, but if that data exists, it doesn't mean it can't or it can't be applied to the network. Um, if you look at, uh, I don't think it shows it on this screen here. Um, no, it doesn't. But we will identify all the access points to a, um, uh, a station. This is obviously the, the site itself, but Waterloo, for example, um, may have 14 different access points. Clearly, what we want to understand is whether they are step ramps or whether they are lifts uh, and so on. So the accessibility piece is definitely uh, important. I guess we just got to, the premise for me is to capture where, where the networks are and then start to build on the on the, the attribution in terms of that gives you a bit more detail about um, what's actually going on in that space. So accessibility okay. definitely is on, it, on our radar. But it may be useful to know that that data does exist as it was all collected uh, at public expense, I believe, funded by the FT some years back for accessibility charities that are uh, charities are providing detailed micro planning. And in theory, it should be possible to export that data from their format so that it's it's available for other purposes other than just just that site. So um, yeah, no, that'd be something to follow up on. Thanks. Yes, please. Um, that would be ideal. I think currency again is, is quite a key thing, I guess. It's easy to do. Uh, well, it's easy. It's important to 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 collect third party data, I guess, as a user, knowing whether that data is current um, could be a thing. But I think half the battle is just getting that data in, in, in a form where you can start looking at accessibility um, and whether those that whether that data set is still current. Um, yeah, um, it's, it, it presents a different problem, a nicer problem, oh, uh, nicer than not having it anyway. Yeah. Um, what was it? I think there was last one thing I was going to ask was. I think we may have covered it. This is a couple of examples where um, bus geometry, as I mentioned before, GTFS files are available through BODs um, and the geometry is quite different. Um, what is evident is that the geometry is ca captured with against OpenStreetMap, um, which I guess is easy because it's freely available and you can start publishing it. But in, but in Ordnance Herber, you can see that it's, it's in terms of accuracy, it's quite different. Well, I say quite different. It's different enough that you probably want to, wouldn't, you probably wouldn't have, wouldn't want to drive over curbs and so on. But it looks like it's correct. I guess the question really I have is, uh, is there any value in making, you know, it, yeah, making the BODs data snap to the high OS uh, highways network or leave it as it is? And does it present any problems? That it, does it matter? I guess is the, is, the, is a short question. What, does it matter that the geometry of a of a bus route is different to perhaps the real world? But in essence, you can still see that on a map. Yeah, I I think we probably need to have that conversation as part of the more detailed um, session that we're going to have in January. Um, much as I would like to have that discussion now, I think we're just running out of time rather rapidly yes. um and so um i think if we uh, we will add that to the list of topics for um a special session in january uh, on this um thank you tim it's longer than 15 minutes i've ever had um, <laughs> yeah. <that. laughs> um but yeah hopefully um there's food for thought um definitely give an update and if you welcome me back i'll i'll be back yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about a date in January. OK, I do need to shoot off. I wasn't planning to stay, but I've got some other stuff to try and get done before Christmas. So um, yeah. wish you all a good Christmas and uh, have a good break and see you in the new year, hopefully. Yeah, thank you very thank much you. indeed, Simon. Yes. That's been thank very, you. very interesting. Thank you, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much, Simon. Yeah, really great. Cheers. Thanks, Dan. See you, Tom. I'll just take uh, Sarah's uh, email and then I'll reach out to her. <laughs> there it yeah. is, as I remembered it quickly. Or yeah. so many so I knew that was well. going to be useful um and interesting that's been even more interesting and generated even more discussion um which is why uh you know we will follow it up with us with a longer session because i think this potentially could become really quite important for um what we're trying to do with public transport yeah. data so uh yeah no cool you're very welcome and, and just a shout out to dan thanks for linking us up with you guys and um 
yeah, hopefully so collaborate with you guys a bit more, hopefully, in the new year. Have a good one. Yeah, thank, you. Excellent. thank you, Simon. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. So if we move on now to um, bus open data update, um, we have got um, Triumph, who is going to um, give us an update on um, the BODS, where the BODS program is. And I've got a few slides, so Triumph, over to you. Sure. Um, next slide, please, please. Okay, so um, I, I, I put together um, a few details around of metrics um, and um, um, so of, yeah, so of metrics, um, so of month to month improvement on metrics. I thought would be <clears throat> would be relevant um, for, for this meeting. So um, all the numbers in yellow um, sort of represent um, sort of the previous reporting period, which was um, sort of reporting period up until the end of October, and the numbers in green uh, sort of uh, represent reporting period up until the end of November. Just so we see, <clears throat> you know, the, the the difference, the improvements and regressions. In terms of metrics for 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 boards, um, <clears throat> there has been sort of one increase um, in sort of you know number of uh, OTC in scope operators uh, publishing uh, data to uh, to boards, um, and you know that you know we we are working constantly with uh, the BCM team uh, uh, with our service uh, service suppliers so KPMG and the OTC. Uh, to ensure that you know we are getting as many in scope of operators publishing data to bots. Um, um, similarly, there's been sort of increasing sort of registered agents and, and local uh, slash local authorities um, um, providing data to bots. There's been increased from 41 to 42, um, and from a timetable perspective, um, you know there has been an in increase in sort of um, in scope operators publishing timetables, particularly. Um, and you know um, the numbers are pretty much sort of self-explanatory. Um, from, uh, from a vehicle locations perspective, um, there's also been an increase in in-scope operators publishing location data uh, from 338 to 342, um, and of you know numbers of published vehicles. Well, that that was in the last 24 hours. The last 24 hours from when I gave this to the team um, has also increased. So at the moment, we are looking at about 30,000 um, odd vehicle um, ADL data being published to, to boards um, at the moment. Um, in terms of the provision of occupancy data, uh, there have been, you know, that is a slight fluctuation in the number of vehicles providing occupancy data to boards. Um, in terms of looking forward, you know, at a forward look at boards, that is something we'll be focusing on to ensure that you know we could gain as much occupancy data as we can um, uh, from 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 boards. Um, in terms of operators providing first data, there's also been an increase. So we've got 331 operators currently providing first data uh, to boards. Uh, that has been an increase from 326. And there's also been an increase in the number of single fair triangles being published. Uh, to BODs, um, as well as you know, an increase in the number of flat flat fit. Uh, just give me a minute. Uh, my my son is about to bust into the room now. Um, um, yeah. Um, there's also been uh, also. I apologize for that. <laughs> if you can hear him crying in the background, <laughs> I apologize. Um, there has been an increase in the number of um single uh, operator daily tickets and weekly tickets um, and you know we we continue to work on the create fairs data service and you know um, continue to um, exert BCM efforts to ensure that you know um, data being published to uh, to boards you know uh, increases um, and and is compliant um, and represents a, a true picture of, of of the industry um, yeah that's 
the provision of uh, metrics data in a nutshell. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, if there are no questions, yeah. I'm I'm happy to to move on to hey, the yeah. next slide. All right. You've you put your hand up. Till, yeah, okay. I can wait until you finish the complete thing about bots, or we can ask questions now. Uh, which way do you want to play it, Tim? I'm happy mean? to take questions now. Okay. In terms of bots, there was a, a release email that came through today. Which, okay. Yeah, on about release 1.2, 1.0. Yeah. I'm not being funny. It It could do with some explanations on this because it's not clear to me and I've been involved in it a good number of years, what it's saying or what the impact is to me as a publisher or the impact that I've got to look at at the data that we're publishing for. It's, yeah, it doesn't make a great deal of sense to me. For example, integration of the traffic commissioner's OTC API into BODS database. You know, daily refresh tasks to update and delete OTC services as they updated in API. What's that doing? I really don't know. Yeah. Ian, it's an interesting point you raised that I have to say, not being someone that actually has to do stuff as a result of that, I had a very similar thought when I saw it this morning. I'm like, okay, that could be like, I, 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 mean, I emailed them back and said, Do you want to put it into some plain English that we can understand? And as I say, I've been involved in this really early, and that looks and when you guys start going on at DFT about using a Python library and you go into that GitHub to download stuff, anybody in local government, you haven't got a cat in hell's chance of trying to get anything down from that. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, you need to have a look at this because it really, that, I would turn around and say that that isn't really fit for what it's supposed to be uh, uh, doing. Okay. Um, okay, I, 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 I'll take that feedback. Um, I mean, thank you very much for the feedback. I think you know if 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 you don't mind, I'm I'm happy to um, I'm happy to pick up with um, both both people who who um, sort of talked about this to to better understand um, you know how we can we can make that more you know more explicit, more more explanatory, and I'm happy to send a revised um, a revised release um, update to. To everybody, to to reflect that. Does that does that make sense? I think it is that translation layer triumph. Okay. Really, it's 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 kind of what does it mean to different people? Like, I mean, I don't know how you guys plan whether you send it out to everyone or updates, but it it, it is that. What does it mean for certain types of audiences? I think that's definitely that struck me as definitely missing just from that one. I, I haven't looked at them all, but um, yeah, it would be would be really probably really helpful and probably help people. Okay. Um, um, be able to take relevant actions and stuff. That'd be cool. Good stuff. I'd, I'll take that away, and um, I would then, um, yeah, I, I would, I would carry out the appropriate actions and, and you know, disseminate updates to, to all relevant parties. Um, thank you very much for that. Yeah. The good news about that particular update, one point twenty one point zero, is that um, there's been a few problems in testing, and so therefore its pr release is probably delayed until the new year. So, <laughs> if you don't not understanding what's in it, actually, probably doesn't matter at the moment. Um, <laughs> but to be uh, honest, yeah. Tim, you actually you actually hit on a really good point there. What's the busiest time of year for data, and why the hell do we do releases at the busiest time of the data? This is not the first time there's been a bods update in December when there's Christmas data. Come on, let, let's actually yeah. schedule it at a reasonable time. Yeah. Uh, okay. OK, David. I just going to say that we we did say don't do it in December, but what it is, is it's just that the update from the traffic commissioner's um, website that the operator sees which services um, belong to them is going to be updated because at the moment it was only taken last February and it's going to be updated and each day going forward it will be updated so an operator will know whether the traffic commissioner has got update registrations from them and they will know which services they need to publish still well, thank you for that plain english description david <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay, um, Becky. Yeah, I'd like to say thanks for that description as well, because I didn't understand the email either. Um, I just wanted to ask something about um, some of the, the metrics that you, that's been provided. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking it would be useful to know from mainly for me the timetable point of view because the, the deadline it, uh, for publishing is 42 days, isn't it, prior? Um, have we got some metrics on how many operators are providing the information actually on time? Um, I think that would be very useful uh, because in my experience they're not um, and then on in terms of uh, newly registered uh, operators um, I've been looking at our small operators recently for South Yorkshire um, and there's a large number of them even though they operate what we consider school services they are general local services so should really be registered for BODS, but they're either not registered or they're registered, but they've actually uploaded nothing at all. And I wondered uh, what you were doing um, to actually look at that and actually encourage them to provide the information. And if not just a case of there are this many registered, but do you know in terms of how many should have registered compared to how many actually have registered so we can understand and see that number changing? Um, thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, before, um, I before I answer that question, that um, question um, I'd, I'd, I'd let Sarah come in as well. Um, she has a she question. Has a question. I think. Sorry, yeah, oh, yeah, I just I missed a little, little bit of that. that. Um, is that school that's services? services? Yeah. yeah. They are okay. service. They, they 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 are school services, but they're not closed school services. So they are general services. That ah. a, a local a local service. It's just that they provide a school service, but anybody can get on it. Oh, so it, it is registered. Yeah, something different than I was yeah. thinking. Okay, I'll uh, I'll hand over for uh, answers. I guess. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, um, so we 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 are working. Uh, I can hear. We get. We are working with uh the the DBSA, um to ensure that. You know, um, all registered services um, who should be providing services to boards uh, are providing, you know, the services they need to or the data they need to provide. Um, and, you know, um, yeah, w w working with our, our, our BCN team to, to, to ensure all of that is the case. In terms of, you know, actual data um, of, you know, you know, who amongst them is. Is, is is providing you know the data they should be providing based on the services they are providing i, I don't have that at hand uh, it's something i can take away and, and provide this data uh, uh, to you in terms of the wider conversation around school services they are you know currently internal conversations we are having um you know with you know you know dvsa and and, and other stakeholders um as regards you know school services particularly that um you know that 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 might affect you know the conversation we, we we have going forward around um you know school services um and you know i, I would update the the, the the group as 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 we conclude those conversations um i, I don't know if that's if that's a sufficient answer to the question you asked um Rebecca. yeah I, th I think it like i say they're not they're not a closed school service but mm -hmm. they they like i say it, the general public can get on it and, and, and pay and use the service would you want to probably not but you could um <laughs> but yeah it, it, i think it's just a case of if you're providing metrics it'd be really handy to see those kind of figures as well to know <laughs> you know the who should be registered compared to who is registered and like i say with with the actual uploads of information what's on time as well so we can actually sort of un see things improving hopefully mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I'll take that action away and um, I'd update the, um, I'd update this forum um, hopefully by the next by the next meeting. Um, Thank you. OK, is there anything more for Triumph that you've got some more slides on the next? Um, developments, but. So I'd, I'd share my screen saying that OK, you know, yeah, your document is there. No one you can see my screen. Yep. Yep. 
so I just I just thought um you know as part of this you know this meeting I I provide some some information um as to sort of the, the enhancements we've made to uh to 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 the to the product um over the course of the last month and the work that we're doing to you know to ensure the enhancement so um you know there has been uh sort of uh from a user experience perspective or US perspective um you know um there has been you know some you know enhanced uh, partnership registration work uh and you know and some data policy work around still data set um you know on 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 the program so we uh we we EPs and you know and 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 the implications for registration or the decentralization of registration um you know we 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 are we are working with um of the various local transport authorities to to find out you know how how that would be surfaced uh surfaced to board um you know there's also been some development work on post publishing checks uh check in reports um and the OTC API um from a business chain management perspective you know we've been working with the VSA um and local authorities uh to to improve data quality uh, and compliance um and we've also developed um a, a data analysis package for consumers of board data um to aid uh better consumption of of data uh from boards um then um the MVP for uh uh the first validator um uh was deployed last month um uh to to is currently in the test environment and um at some point we would complete UAT um um you know very 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 soon. Um there has been a release of uh the multi-operator user journey uh to the production environment uh as far as create third data service is concerned. Um and so that was these are the activities that 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 you know sort of took place in November going forward. Um, you know, we are looking to sort of complete the work around ET registrations and data quality, um, especially around sort of, you know, the, the removal of still data sets from, from boards. Then we are also going to comment some um some work around sort of uh disruptions. Um DST has decided to go down uh the route of of developing its own disruption messaging service. Uh and you know that work. Um, have comments so sort of uh, user experience and um, you know interactions and liaising uh, and user research with uh, uh, local transport authorities have comments and that work will continue into December. Um, we will continue to work with operators, local authorities, and um, you know around sort of compliance and you know and data quality improvement, um, as well as you know continue to iterate and fine tune. Um, you know the the data analysis package for consumers. Um, <clears throat> um, we intend uh, for uh, the simple first validator uh, uh, to be released. Um, um, hopefully, you know um, this month. Um, and we intend to comment of conversations around user journey for uh, for for first capping um, in in December. Um now in terms of um sort of uh um consumer uh, consumers and consumer journeys we 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 released the board data extractor package um in, in November. Um you know then we had sort of a a, a a feedback session with these consumers um around the board data extractor package um and all of this is you know is around of driving and improving you know consumption of data from boards which you know essentially is, is, is the essence of the endeavor um we have been working with local authorities to develop um clear pipelines um you know for you know for ensuring that boards is the single single source of information for um you know uh, for our rti schedules um you know going forward um and we are also holding discussions uh, on changes to improve timetable data standards, uh, and and all of this is based on feedback that we have received from consumers. Um, so that's what we we did in November, going into next month. Um, 
you know, we, we realized that the, the there can be um, there is an opportunity for for greater promotion uh, for boards. So going into this monitor, greater promotion for boards, and and that's something we we want to spend some time doing. Um, then we're going to do some work around sort of you know um, automated feedback system uh, from you know through you know for problem data set, so expired data set, um, as well as sort of uh, complete, completeness uh, of line level information on board. So um, that is something we intend to work on this month. Um, then um, there is conversation around uh, a trans exchange um, uh, a data tool. Um, we, we realize and we understand that the current exchange, um, Excel based trans exchange uh, are, are data tool that we're making available to, to people who do not have any other means of reporting trans exchange data is increasingly becoming um, unfit for purpose. So we are looking at, um, you know, other alternatives to ensure that, you know, we can support uh, data publishers who want to publish trans exchange data set. So, um, you know, in the course of the last few months, um, we have, you know, upgraded various options um, around of a trans exchange tool for publishing trans exchange data. And hopefully this month and maybe going into, you know, early next month, um, we can start having the conversations we need to have uh, with, you know the, the the various internal stakeholders to to support um you know the adoption um, of one of the options that have been identified uh, to ensure that data sub, um, publishers can publish data and drive compliance of of, of data as far as trans exchange is concerned. Um, from a create first, create first perspective, um, create first data perspective. You know, a full multi operator user journey was released to production last month. Um, there has been a new feature to allow users to configure uh, NetX export uh, that has been released to production as well. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, a first validator um, is ready for user access and testing. Um, then um, the first validation reporting has been completed um, as far as board service is concerned. Um, like I mentioned earlier, going into this month, um, we hope to you know, commence development for user journeys for capping. Um, we we have started speaking to ETM suppliers around sort of you know the, the validator and, and including them in in, in, in in the work we are doing around first validator and um, we're also looking to develop um, a first uh, data catalog within the wider board data catalog. Um, from a procurement update, there has been a lot of conversations around what the commercial future of boards is going to look like. Um, I can confirm that. Next year, we would be, you know, taking that to, to competition, taking that to, 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 to market for competition. We are currently working with, um, you know, Crown Commercial Services around developing, you know, the appropriate procurement strategy uh, to take both the market. Um, to accommodate a full, um, complete, um, you know, a, a, a procurement process, um, it is possible that we might have to, um, you know, extend the contract for a couple of months, maybe three to six months, to ensure that we can do everything right and and, and get it right. Um, the procurement we are we are looking at, as far as the service is concerned, would um, include boards uh, itself, uh, create fair data service, um, as well as a procurement to to continue with the work around, you know, the DFT developed open source. Uh, disruption messaging service. Um, a discussion as to how, how we, we are going to procure this would, would depend on, 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 on the finalization of that procurement strategy, but I would update you know, appropriate stakeholders as to, as to how we, we progress with that. And yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's updates on, on activity um, in a nutshell. Happy to take any questions as well. Thank you, Trump. Um, Ian. Okay, this, this is about uh, being the one source of information, et cetera. Uh, it, it, it isn't, it, it can't be, to be honest. I'm looking at this, the, op the operations in our area and all of them have got greater than 10% of no data. So it, you know, if you're losing 10% of the data, looking at ABODs, when you're mixing the BODs and ABODs, it, it just isn't there. The, the, the data analysis, 
that's coming out of ABOS, which we would judge on, is not what I would believe. There is no way some of those services can be operating as frequently as early as it is, as they are reported in ABODs, because we would be inundated with calls, complaints at, at, uh, at timing point level. It, and between that and the lack of connectivity with the actual registration process, if they're going to do anything, you need to do something about slimlining and joining together all the different registration processes. So you've got one, you do have one version of the truth. At the moment, it isn't. When you look at what's in BODS, what's on the registration system and what's actually operating, you've got three different entities. So until that's sorted out, as a, it's very difficult to see this as being a one source of truth. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, um, for, for the comment, um, you know, I, I, I appreciate it. I think, you know, um, I, 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 yeah, I share, I share, I share, I share, you know, some of your sentiments um, around of, um, you know, you know, data enabled and some of the data on boards as well as sort of, you know, some, some form of um, registration improvement, um, if not registration reform. I think from a DFT perspective, um, we understand that these are things that need to happen, and 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 these are some of the considerations we you know we have in terms of the work we want to do going forward. Um, you know, some of some of some of the results we might you know we might achieve um, soon. Some of them not so soon. Um, you know, things like of registration improvements and registration reform, and that's purely because of the amount of stakeholders we need to work with um, to ensure that happens. And um, but but yeah, thank you. We 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 are putting all of this in consideration, and you know, as the result of the work um, that we are doing uh, come out, we will be updating all our stakeholders and you know, um, especially members of this forum. Yeah, I understand what you're saying on that one. I mean, I know I've had a, a couple of calls on with the FT, KPNG, and there seems to be the concentration on small operators who are offering closed school services that aren't BOD's requirements on the, on the workflow diagram that we received, and yet nobody's prepared to take that work for it. It's got to go to a DVSA individual who then look at each individual contract but in the time in between times there's communications with the operators getting concerned and and we're saying hey no you, you're not part of it because we're following what the guidelines are and the concentration seems to be in the wrong area because i mean if you look at the there was a recent report on where was it it was passenger transport about something that was happening in the south uh, an hundred ninety thousand pound fine but it, it was admitted at that time that by DVSA that 40% of the services weren't operating. It was in BODS. I mean, that is a hell of a figure from a national organisation. So uh, uh, the concentration doesn't seem of resources isn't in the right area from what I'm saying. Um, yeah, um, I'm happy to um, I'm happy to pick up with you, um, Ian, to you know, to flesh, you know, to flesh this, you know, to flesh this out further. And, and, and hopefully we can, you know, we can come to, to someone to, or better understanding. Um, and, and, and hopefully that can, you know, your, your, your position can, can better inform the work we do and, 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 and the way we deliver it. Um, um, I'd reach out to you after this meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Triumph for that. That's a useful update. Um, I've had an uh, an update on fares from Stephen Penn, who um, is unable to join us this afternoon. Um, so, as Triumph said, there's been development work going on for with the validator. Um, Stephen's expecting to start to onboard users for acceptance testing in January um, and hopes that the validator um, will be able to go live in February um, and says that data from 
fares, producing systems, um, ticketer, VIX, the FDS, etc., should all be able to produce validator compliant NetEx for fares by the time of release of the validator, um, which is good news if um, that goes to plan. Um, Stephen's starting work on guidance for producing complex fares. So at the moment, um, the requirement is to supply the simple simple fares in inverted commas because some of the ones that are required aren't actually that simple, but more complex fares. He's going to start producing the guidance in January. Um, the current regulatory deadline for publishing complex fares is also January, um, but he does say that um, that won't be enforced um, and um, the provisional date for operators to publish by is revised to September 2023. So presumably that will be coming out at some point fairly soon um, in a more formal format than just um a, an update to PTIC. Um John. I'm just wondering if we're not getting uh, into a situation where we're actually introducing complexity into fares. And there was a large number quoted in the uh, document that I read. And really, I mean what the alternative approach and remember that several of us around the table were involved with the fares exchange work that was done for um, transport direct basically you can divide fares into those which are complex enough that they require a fare table but they are not necessarily formulaic in the way that that table is constructed and in that case, surely the best thing is just to transmit the file and uh, get on with it. And it can apply to one or more ser services. You know, many operators have a standard distance related fare table, um, which applies across all their services. But then you've got the various uh, generally multi, multi uh, operator tickets that apply to uh, periods you know, day tickets, rover tickets, that sort of thing. Um, and they apply to, as, as single operators also have the same sorts of fares. And finally, you've, you've got the flat fares and there may well be a few exemptions to that those classifications. But if you could be talking about the classifications rather than introducing complexity, um, I think it would make it far easier both for operators and again local authorities to maintain this data because that's that's what it's going to come down to at the end of the day. Yeah, um, I I think that that discussion the, the that discussion um, happened a number of years ago, John, um, and now. The, the deadlines and the requirements of what is in complex and simple fares is in secondary legislation. So um, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, so so yes, we can have that discussion and yeah, conversation, but, uh, but that actually but, happened four or five years ago. Um, and actually where we are now is we need to make the best of, of the current situation and progress as, as rapidly as we can once the guidelines and guidance has been produced. Yeah, I, I, I just worry that if we accept a situation that is taking more resources than are necessary and resources which are going to become probably even rarer in years to come, then we're not going to be in a position to make all the improvements that the national bus policy and other things must uh, uh, really require us to make. Mm, mm, mm. And given where we are, I'm not quite sure where we where we go from that. But again, I think Triumph—that's a something to you know. 
just to be aware of that actually the the resources and the effort that needs to go into this is is competing with lots of other things probably um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. If, it's only, if it's only in secondary legislation, at least it's easier to change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you know, I mean, it could go through with alterations as a result of Brexit, for example. Anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I suggest that um, in the interest of time, we have the... Uh, uh, the Naptan update from Sarah and we come back to um, the profile changes uh, paper um, once we've had uh, the, the updates from uh, from Sarah and Travel Line. So Sarah, thank you for Hi. sticking <laughs> with us. <laughs> No worries, it's been interesting to listen. I'll have to go back and listen to the little bit that I missed as well. Um, great to see you all and looking festive. Look at this. I mean, I'm letting the team down, you know, we've got pencil, we've got hats. Uh, maybe we need some mince pies, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, so in terms of updates, um, first of all, apologies. If we're going to start with an apology in terms of I did uh, host a public meeting about the uh, NAPTAM mapper, which is what we call the new ito world for us if people you know the tool that uh, ito world provided for us previously to map the stops on a map and internally within dft we have now created our own mapper as it would um as some comments before i fully appreciate that um within government and things like that we don't really expect people to be going to github and you know grabbing code and that so it's not our preference it's where we are at, at the moment so um i will be setting up sessions which is where the apology comes from because i've not got around to that um, thus far i actually broke my shoulder six weeks ago so uh, <laughs> yes it, oh. I, I can see the reaction it was very painful um it, it pulled out of the socket and snapped it was, it was yeah not great <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I've been delayed with things. <laughs> um, so we've been building up from that. Um, yeah, we need to get these sessions out so we can, uh, you know, interact with you all and, and see how to use that because um, Git and code is not our first or easy thing to do for most of us, to be honest. And even with me, I've dallied in it before and still forget how to do certain things. Hopefully we've set it up in a way where you can go just click and it'll run. Um, so it shouldn't be too much of a demo and should work quite smoothly for most of us, um, has been set up in mind with the fact that we are all in uh, local authorities or within government, so things like um, access and all that is sorted out. In the future, in the new year, hopefully we're going to move away from that and it will just be a web page. There's just a few security things now, which is great, um, like, for example, even from CDDO, so the Chief uh, Digital Data Office within the government, um, we've got to obviously abide by the uh, rules and principles of how we can host that in a secure manner. Um, and when we do, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's when we're going to get the use out of this, because I, I um, understand that it's not, again, everyone's go to to be going and clicking code and running things. Um, in terms of other things in Naptan, um, internally, um, I don't know if you will have uh, been aware, but there is um, within DFT, there's been um, a change of contract for, for providers. Um, so some of the team within Naptan will be moving off uh, in the new year and we'll be getting some new developers, for example, and uh, BAs. Um, and at the moment, I'm looking at the roadmap and scoping that out, looking at what the work will look like. I'm very aware over the last two, three years, most of the work within Naptan has been sort of behind the scenes and, you know, database based sort of thing and uh, techie. Um, has delivered a lot in terms of um, usability for the, for the customers using data. So I'd like to really focus on that in the new year, really. So running um, an internal uh, data quality program um, and re-engaging with local authorities that haven't given data or have stopped giving data for whichever reasons. Um, but also re-engaging with local authorities that haven't given data for quite a long time, um, understanding that. And other things, for example, there's, there's some things overhanging like, you know, Welsh, the conversion to Welsh language. Um, obviously, the um, ACO codes and splitting of them um, for certain regions, we need to delve into that a little bit more and understand how we can best help our users with that. And there's a few other little bits there, really. Um, 
Uh, alongside that, we have the future of NAPTAN. So um, as you'll be aware, we had a future of NAPTAN and there was a report produced and I have, again, have said before, but it's not quite um, come to fruition at the moment. The future of NAPTAN report will be made public. Um, it should have been done by now, <laughs> um, but we were waiting for a data strategy. So there is an external data strategy and I'm sure you'll have sympathies with the fact that we've obviously changed in terms of um, government and MPs and uh, various ministerial teams, um, which is why the uh, strategy number one hasn't gone out at the moment because it needs to be be ratified and uh, signed off again, um, ready for release. And also that's when the future of NAPTAM report will go alongside. I am going to try and push the future of NAPTAM report to be released um, before that because I don't really want it being chained to that and preventing certain things. So, for example, um, the next phase of future of NAPTAM uh, will be going up to tender next year. And obviously it would be great for people that are bidding for that um, and putting in uh, documentation um, to provide a case for them to know what was done in the first part of future of NAPTAM. So hopefully that'll all coincide nicely. If not, it'll be from February onwards that when the transport strategy is out that everything will then follow. Um, what else have we got going on? Um, I think that's it really at the moment. Is there any questions on NAPTAN that I can help with while we're here? And if you've emailed and there's some certain things, um, you know, we can highlight them now. Um, I am catching up on emails uh, due to the shoulder injury. Ian? Ian. Yeah, apologies. Yeah, go back to an old chestnut that we raised quite a while ago. Is the uh, within NAPTAN, we really do need a field or a stop that can be categorised as a school stop only. Particularly when yeah. thinking about all the other stuff around BODs at the moment, you know, and we do have school stops only, not on public, not sorry, necessarily on the private grounds, but on the highway as well. So that really would be helpful. Absolutely, that's in hand, as we've said, uh, Triumph alluded to before. We've got internal discussions going on. Um, I wasn't aware, which I am now, that there was already, like you say, some services that have school stops that are separate to other stops. I was just first looking down the avenue of just privately you know hosted sort of school routes and um, because that discussion's ongoing I need to see what the outcome of that will be and then from there we will move forward and I do agree obviously if there is that type of stop then we need to create something and um, the whole issue uh, preventing this at the moment obviously is sort of um safety and safeguarding um of you know lower, knowing p positions of the bus stops um which school children will be alighting from etc so um Possibly this won't be an issue, but it's something that we need a few a few minds together to discuss how we go forward on it. But I appreciate your comment. OK, thank you. Yeah, um, I've got um, apologies for attendance from Keith Sabin from Shropshire, um, but he did ask um, a specific question about NAPTAN and the lat long coordinates um, and the fact that they were less authorities are supplying them um, and that that's causing some consistency problems um, with consumption um, and and it would be he thinks it would be good to go back to having consistency so you know what data you know the minimum data set um, in NAPTAN and that should include uh, lat long because actually that's more useful in many ways than ordnance yes. survey grid yeah, so um, I think this was an email I've just responded to yesterday um, and I'm happy to, to, to go over for the for the benefit of the room. Um, yes, so with Lat Long, we have obviously some of you will be aware if it's your own data as well. Um, so we have people that provide um, just Eastings and Northings um, and then we also have people that provide Eastings and Northings and Long and Lat. And then we also have people that just provide Long and Lat. So um, as, a, as a general data principle in my 12 years of data management, um, I wouldn't really want to be overwriting anyone's data. And this is where we're stuck at the moment because if someone gives us Eastings and Northings and their own long and lat and for the people that don't give us long and lat we then want to impute those which is fine we can calculate and impute those we have this uh, conundrum of what we do with the long lat that have been provided by do we overwrite those because for me that's not what you should do at source so it, again it's definitely a next year question it's not even a future of a nap time question it is a nap time question which we'll be looking at in the new year um, and we've had a few discussions about this um, whether just to yes contact everyone that does provide long and lat and we can have a discussion and maybe we do just we overwrite it with one formula the difference with long and lat is there is a lot of free converters out there for sure and um, within the uh, mathematical sort of slight uh, formula there is slight differences which is why some of them will be different and if we calculate long and lat then it's going to be slightly different than someone's given us a long and lat um, 
yeah, it's one of those lovely data questions, isn't it? <laughs> and conundrums where I'm a bit stuck. But I hope that we will come to a resolution on this because I do believe that, yeah, this this needs to be corrected. Um, obviously on the, the far side of it, which I'm sure we won't go towards, I think the way that we are leaning towards is imputing some of it, whether it overwrites it, I'm not sure, or if, whether it just puts ones that weren't there or weren't provided, that could be an answer. The other far side of it would be to have not, not long and light at all if everyone had provided these things and all things, but then that would be putting an onerous on people um, to, to choose their own way of the conversion of long and lat. But like I say, I think that's on the far end of where we're, we're, we're sort of looking at, at the moment. Um, I think a couple of hands went up then. Is there any more comments on that? Keith and then Dan. So mine was about the future of NAPTAN. Um, oh, are we, the public, still unaware of what the future of NAPTAN is? And we have to wait till next year, you say? Is it a bit, sorry. Sorry, I've mentioned it a bit. There was a public meeting. I don't know if you were able to see that. I do need to publish that onto YouTube. So I've given an overview of what it was um, and I'm happy to um, obviously circulate that video when I once I get it uploaded online. Um, it's just the actual report that we've not been able to circulate. Like I say, I'm happy to say that we looked into accessibility and um, we looked into sort of um, bus stop accessibility and um, things that might help uh, people with disabilities, for example. We also touched on the Welsh language and we also looked into another area which fails to evade my, my mind at the moment. Um, what was it? Anyone else on the call that might be aware of what we looked into? <laughs> um, oh yes, sorry, other modes of transport. Sorry, my mind is in a few projects at the moment. So yes, other modes of transport. So for example, we've obviously got buses and trains, etc. on there. We're looking at, um, you know, do we include what we call micro mobility? So um, access to stops for bikes, e-bikes and e-scooters. Um, and there's, there's a bit of a bit of scoping on that. So that's what we say the future of NAPTAN. The future of NAPTAN is every, anything that's not in there at the moment. Yeah. Other NAPTAN stuff that I deal with will be data quality and things that are happening now. So I want you to rest assured that that is still being looked after. And that's why we, um, or we outsource the future of NAPTAN work so that we can get that done in parallel. And there will be another another section going out on that. Like I say, it will be going out to tender maybe February, March next year, because we feel that what we did is a lot of secondary research for the future of NAPTAN, which is perfect because there's a lot of stuff out there already. There's a lot of um, accessibility information and we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We also don't want to put the pressure on local authorities to now start providing this data for us on top of what they already provide. So we want to look at other ways in which we could harbour that data and bring it into NAPTAN if it is the best place for it to be. So the next um, alpha, I guess, would be another, uh, you know, discovery, sorry, another discovery uh, for the future of NAPTAN is because we feel like there was a lot more information out there that we still need to, to, to guard to see what's going on with it. I hope that was enough information, but yeah, do get in touch with me if you'd like a bit more. Um, and I will be trying to get that video up online because I, I am able to say publicly what we've done, but just the release of the report and it being perfect before it goes out is the bit that we've not been able to do at the moment. Is it still the intention that the DFT is making their own NAPTAN editor as well? Is that still what's in the pipeline? That was a thought. Yes, I remember that. That is some, that is something that we we it, it was very lightly touched on in, in that part of it. Um, it's not something that we're, we're starting at the moment um, and I'll have to pick that up with the future of NAPTAN as well. OK. Sorry, I can't provide any more on that at the moment. I remember the conversations we've had now, Keith. <laughs> OK, Dan. Yeah, mine's more just a quick comment on the East North thing that long. So obviously you're going to be reaching out and hopefully having conversations with Ordnance Survey about it. Ordnance Survey provide both their data in East <laughs> North thing and that long. So I would suggest having that conversation with them about how they unify their approach of getting data in both formats and using the same methodology. Because it'd be great if the same was used across both data sets. Um, yeah, more of a comment on anything else. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting point. And to be honest, um, the other side of NAPTAN as well is, well, NUPTIG. I don't know if everyone calls it NUPTIG or NPTG. I go with NPTG, but you know, it's both the same thing. And um, that is something that um, with the Gazetteer I've thought about as well, rather than us having our own Gazetteer. Um, again, I don't want to cause any, um, you know, upset here, but the fact that we might in the future, it might be better to use like an ordinance survey sort of gazetteer that's, you know, kept up to date by other people um, and is is quite uh, frequently updated as well um, instead of the MPTG. These are all thoughts for the new year. I think sometimes I forget how broad NAPTAN is because, you know, I'm sat there and it's a data set and I'm getting data in, but there is all of these aspects to look into and they are all in hand. OK, excellent. Any more questions for Sarah? No? OK. 
Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Do you want me just to touch on the future on the fine transport data, or are we running out of time? Um, I think that that's probably best for another time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd I'd like to bring Triumph back in. Um, to talk about disruptions briefly, because there was some questions about that that we failed to address. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, <clears throat> so, um, as we all know, um, at the moment, um, we, we inherited uh, the transport for the North, uh, the Transport for the Service, uh, in 2021, and we have sort of maintained that service and we've got quite a few local authorities who are using that uh, service to to report disruptions messaging. Um, <clears throat> so whilst you know we have maintained that service up until now, um, the commercial arrangements around that service did not fit well with with the expectation uh, within DFT. And you know over the last year, um, we're exploring options to. To you know, to deal with this issue, um, you know, we spoke to the incumbent, and we spoke to quite um, a few other suppliers of uh, uh, disruption messaging service to to find what the best solution would be. Um, upon upon all of that, we've we've de decided to to go ahead with you know developing our own open source, open code, DFT owned and maintained uh, disruption messaging service. Um, at the moment, what, what the intention is is that well, you know that 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 mandate to develop has started. Conversations are being had with users and stakeholders. Um, uh, the intention is by summer, the end of summer next year, um, a tool will be handed over to DFT that would be a like for like replacement of the current solution. Um, after which we would then begin to iterate and improve on that tool going forward. So um, yes, um, that would mean that local authorities who are currently using, you know, the the tool we inherited from Transport for the North, at some point would have to be migrated over to the new tool and be trained on using the new tool. Um, um, but but that's that's the situation with uh, with disruption messages. Okay, thank you. Um, Jonathan. Hi, Triumph. Jonathan Hi. Rapier, Transport API. Um, you were talking there about the tool, I, I assume principally um, about the data acquisition, the way that you put the data into the, the system. Um, local authorities use that tool to upload um, disruptions. What about the consumption downstream uh, by um, uh, developers, apps, and others. Uh, what 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 were your conclusions with respect to that part? As you know, we currently are continuing the transport for the north um, downstream delivery. Uh, I'm just wondering what your what your thinking was on that that side. So I, I think from from a consumption perspective, um, the, the intention for us um, has always been to. To make that available um, uh, for consumption uh, uh, within BODs, um, but you know that that's the intention. Um, but um, I am open to having a conversation with, say, um, other entities who would like to uh, consume the data from the tool and and see how that's going to work um, for us and for them. I, I cannot make any promises at the moment, but I am open to. The conversation uh, to sort of explore the out of what is possible um, would be my position. So you would be thinking in terms of um, building an API mm -hmm. that makes it possible to retrieve that, because obviously at the moment the the APIs it, that, that we provide is, um, is is a post request, which is quite mm -hmm. a lot more complex than than simple get requests. Okay. Um, and um, it's a bit that the, the engineering around that is a bit more complex for, to both to create and to consume um, it, uh, unless you wrap it around you know unless you have a, a, a simpler filtering based um, get uh, get API so you need a whole family of APIs to be able to filter down from that so I would just encourage you to um, you know th th think through the, the the downstream publication 
um, before you finish, you know, the design of the upstream data collection and that you have a model for that um, and that you enable the scalability of access to that data. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Um, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Um, and like I said, um, yeah, um, I'm, I am I am open to to sort of further um, exploring um, all of that with any interested parties. OK, thank you, Triumph. Thank you. Um, in terms of travel line updates, um, I've had apologies um, since we've been in this meeting from Julie, who says she'll provide a written update for the minutes. Um, which will be more meaningful after our TIL board meeting next week when we should be able to share some news on work that is waiting board approval. So she's a bit of a tease. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that will be interesting. Um, uh, I think it's probably whilst we're talking about travel line um, worth just uh, welcoming Mike Nolan, who is on the call, um, who has in the last few months um, joined Traveline. Hi, Mike. Do you want to explain your role briefly? Yeah, hi, thanks, Tim. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I know a number of uh, names and faces on the call uh, from working in my previous role at West Yorkshire Combined Authority, uh, where I've been for the last 20 years. So, in the last 10 years, specifically working on passenger information and ticketing. Um, so yeah, I joined Traveline as Customer Experience Manager back in October. Um, so just getting my head around the process and the systems and what improvements we can make uh, for customers, both in the provision of data and the uh, information services that we offer. So I'll be working alongside Julie very much on the de development of Traveline and also Plus Bus as well, which we, we now manage. So should be seeing and speaking to a lot more in the future. So yeah, thanks, Tim. And as I say, Julie will provide a written update. She was due to be here. It was a uh, very much a last minute withdrawal, so I don't have anything to share with you, so I'll leave the suspense and we'll be in touch next week. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Um, OK, so um, I think that, um, right, so EU standard development, that's just a very simple update on where a number of the standards are and um, parts. So that you've had seen all of that before, but everything's moved on a little bit in the last three or four months. Anything to do with SEN um, and international standards um, is always a bit sluggish and slow, um, but that progresses. Um, we've not had any more on any new issues log items. The one item that is open um, is, is actually referenced in the updates and changes to PTI profiles paper, um, which um, we haven't talked about um, and potentially will take um, some time to go through. Um, so the PTI profile um, for Trans Exchange um, in particular has been um, pretty stable for a while. People have been using it um, and learning where and where it doesn't work and where it does work. Um, and so in the coming um, weeks and months, there's a number of um, updates um, and advice that will be being worked on um, and coming out. So this paper sort of brings attention to some of those. So for example, things like devolved registrations, when the profile and BODS was originally um, thought about, um, it was only the DVSA that issued uh, registrations. Since then, um, enhanced partnerships have come along and um, there is one um, authority that has um, taken those powers at the moment and there is a few more that will be taking those powers um, over the next few months. Um, and so to overcome the challenge of having multiple registration authorities suddenly, um, there'll be some advice coming out um, on that. Um, 
those of you that have been around in the industry for more than about 10 minutes um, will have struggled at some point um, with split registrations and how to handle those and piece that data together. Um, nutty problem. Some advice on how to piece together BODS data for split registrations will be out. I doubt it will be perfect. I doubt it will solve everybody's problems, um, but um, we will give it a go. Um, there is an interesting um, bug in if a document can have a bug um, and, uh, with um, public line names. So some operators, rather than calling something the service 23, they they call it something meaningful to the customer. Um, and um, there's a bit of a problem where that name has a space in it and various other characters. So we need to sort that out. Um, almost um, as long standing and challenging as split registrations is how do you know what version of a file you should use and when are things that superseded. So um, the profile document, I'm going to say attempts to deal with that at the moment, um, but um, there is a need for some more clarity and some update to that. Um, along with bank holidays, which is the um, out open PTIC issue. Um, what I, I don't think there is particular um, clarity about the best way to handle bank holidays is probably the right way to put it. Um, and so um, there will be a session in January on bank holidays um, to gather those of you that are interested in them, um, not from a, having the day off point of view, but how you represent it in a public transport timetable um, to to talk through it and hopefully thrash out um, a, this is how the industry wants them to work. Um, Peter, do you want to come in at that point? You've put your hand up. You're on mute if you're trying to talk. Oh, thank you. You are. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if we could say that these changes, Tim, are, are mainly sort of explanations, aren't they? I, I'm I'm a bit concerned to that we don't have another stalling by people thinking that um, changes are coming through and therefore we're not going to do any developments until all of them are settled and then you know the the the, the response will be be done in one batch with downstream systems because I think most of these things that are being discussed are talking about using of the guidance document in, in order to explain how things are done it doesn't it's not actually requiring new things to be done in most cases no you're, you're absolutely you're absolutely right peter until we get to bank holidays um those topics are yeah it is advice um rather than technical changes yeah absolutely absolutely um, bank holidays, though, um, might involve some technical changes, but that discussion needs to happen. Um, flexible services certainly will be a technical change. Um, it shouldn't affect what people do now for fixed route and fixed timetables, but um, at the moment the profile sort of <laughs> kicked it into the long grass. Um, well, we do actually need to um, deal with it now as it's becoming more and more um, important for core public transport networks. Um, and so um, that will be some technical guidance on, on how to code flexible services, which will change the profile where it is a flexible service. Um, and um, the last one, um, 
that um, I think is is important for this group is modes um, will do that in a way that means that you don't need to make any changes if you're providing bus, but um, there's a desire to include um, tram, metro, light rail, whatever you want to call it um, in your particular area, um, be able to include that into BODS data to try and um, sort of complete the picture a bit more um, for public transport. And so um, there'll be um, an update to um, explain how people can provide that mode and, and provide that information about what sort of operation it is. Um, and um, inevitably the spelling mistakes and um, misdirection between paragraph numbers in the document and things like that, um, we will update. But as Peter quite rightly says, apart from bank holidays and flexible services, um, it'll be uh, documentation changes and advice rather than anything that's going to change things technically. So um, we will set a call up to specifically talk about bank holidays in January. Um, has anybody got any questions about the um, profile paper and questions about that? No, silence. OK, excellent. Um, in which case um, our next meeting will be scheduled for March. Um, as is tradition, um, we will have the OS call in January um, and um, the uh, bank holiday call in January as well. Um, what I suggest that we do um, is as well as putting a date in the diary for March, that we also do it for the June and September meetings as well, so that there's a bit further look ahead for people about when things are um, cropping up. Um, so um, moving on to any other business, Jonathan, you've got your hand up already. <laughs> yes, um, just in respect of the audience service presentation, um, I, I, I wonder if we should reflect as a group uh, about um, the, the, the feasibility of expanding the delivery of by audience survey of data into this community. Um, you have to recall that um, the audience survey license all derived use of their data. Uh, that's chargeable down at all levels um, in you know any any reuse of their data. And that is not the case at the moment for all of the um, services that are using um, uh, OpenStreetMap. Uh, so uh, before any um, head of steam builds up about using their data, um, there should be some reflection on the implications of that. Uh, of course, that is what they want uh, because they operate a central government sponsored business model uh, to promote their services and the you know reuse of their services, but it would increase the cost um, for users uh, if if that was to come into play. Um, so I just wanted to provide a a note of caution there and ask for reflection and for for that for their data provision rules to be put in context um, if they come back to you know make further presentations. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, quite. Fair, Jonathan. Um, it has caused significant problems in the past um, in public transport data provision, um, and a lot of that was overcome um, or avoided um, when we have the um, call with them in January. I will put licensing and reuse of data on the agenda. Um, I did talk to. Um, Simon specifically about it um, in the run up to today as he was uh, thinking about what he was going to say um, and to uh, to get them thinking about that. But I will put that specifically on the agenda because, um, yeah, it does need addressing head on. 
they need to, to a, a, a minimum requirement if they were ever going to do this would be the um, public dedication of all of their internal um, uh, references on all of the all of the uh, uh, objects within their data sets and I think they're highly unlikely to ever concede that because it's at the heart of their their business model uh, because you don't get all of the important linking references in the open data sets that they publish that's the key point and they operate a distinction between the paid for data and the and the open data that does not contain the same content so I think that's a very very important for our community to be to be considered if they were willing to um, to make a change there, that would be uh, would be very interesting, um, and I think you know potentially quite important. But um, I've not seen any signs of that, so I just wanted to flag that. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, anybody else got any other business? No. In which case. Um, thank you all for your time today um, and hope that you have a very good um, Christmas holiday and period um, and um, don't get too many last minute data changes <laughs> and uh, see you all in the new year. <laughs> thanks Tim, thanks everyone. Thanks Tim. Thanks, Tim. Bye. 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 Bye.